Dr. James Cook. Thank you for coming on to the show. This is a pleasure. And um, you're welcome. I just so you are um, a neuroscientist, podcaster, and a psychedelic adventurer. I guess you could say. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair summary. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, what exactly? is your work like i know that you run a podcast and you have a youtube channel but what do you do like what is your actual work that you do yeah so it's i think when you say neuroscientist obviously like i think people get that it refers to the brain but then there's you know uh, ambiguity around like neurologist versus neuroscientist and stuff so to be clear i'm a um I'm a doctor in the sense of phd like kind of like academic research so i'm based in university in london um i actually have a position in ireland as well and um, I do what, what we call basic research, which is kind of, you know, there's not really anything basic about it, but it's what that means is like, you're just trying to understand the brain for its own kind of intellectual sake, uh, instead of trying to, you know, I'm not trying to cure cancer or, or Alzheimer's or any kind of clinical application. But the idea is once you understand the actual organ, then you can, you know, have a better chance of, of curing disorders of it, right? If you don't understand how the heart works, you, you're not gonna have a good chance of like, you know, curing heart disease. Um, so I do what's called basic research into mainly perception and memory. So like things to do with experience, consciousness. Um, I'm particularly interested in how it's structured because the kind of spiritual stuff we might touch on, um, my interest began with a kind of, a kind of spiritual experience when I was a teenager, which was a kind of like a kind of buddhist style awakening experience of like realizing that consciousness isn't actually structured into concepts like we see the world as as like like i see a laptop and i see a microphone and you know all these things and then you can have this experience where you you realize that consciousness is just a field of appearances and that those are like labels that we put on top of it we structure it in a certain way that's kind of illusory in a sense like laptops physicists don't have to explain the existence of laptops there is no laptop essence it's just a way of seeing like different patterns in the world so that those are the kind of questions i'm fascinated by almost trying to understand how the brain leads us into a state of delusion and separate a sense of separation from the rest of the world and suffering um so at the moment i'm working on kind of simulations of uh particularly to do with memory i i've, I've kind of got into questions of how is it that so many different memories can be stored in the brain and then different ones activated at different times what's the role of sleep we think that sleep and dreaming has a, has a kind of a, a role in transferring experiences into memories so at the moment i'm running these kinds of simulations of, of big networks of neurons and i have i have a few ideas about what might be going on there but i'm just trying to get at these very basic questions of what is it about the circuitry of the brain that allows it to do things like memory and perception Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting because, uh, I mean, at, at, you know, when it comes down to it, we are all just memory. It, at least it seems like that. Like, what are we without memory? Mm. We are, Yeah. Um, I don't know, what are we without memory? C can you have a brain without mm. memory? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's actually a fascinating question as to try and define memory because, you know, we might think a memory is you know, my ability to recall walking on the beach with my family as a kid or something like that, like that's a memory, right? Yeah. But then as soon as you try to, to, to figure out what memories are, you realize that's one type of memory that we might call episodic memory because it's like an episode of like something happening over time. But we also call it declarative memory because you can declare it, you can say it, you can like consciously recall it. But then you realize there are other types of memory like riding a bike, this kind of unconscious, non-declarative, non-episodic kind of muscle memory. Um, and then when you really get down to it, you realize that memory is kind of just, it's just kind of carrying information through time in the physical structure of like the organism. Um, and then suddenly it turns out that like plants have memory and, and everything that's alive has memory. Um, and species have memory. Like you can think of, you know, something I, I think about a lot, but I, I don't talk about a lot is that it blows my mind when I think about the fact that evolution, like what I am now is effectively the collective memory of my species and all the other species of the past, like in the sense that they did things, things happened to them, some of them died, some of them survived. And that kind of, all of that stuff happening gets funneled through evolution to create this organism here now. And the reason I have eyes where they are is because it worked for, you know, plucking berries, like berries from trees and, the reason I walk, you know, 
all these different things, you, know, you can list everything about my organism is kind of a memory of the species. Um, mm. So it, it gets a bit trippy when you start to think about memory in that kind of abstract way. Um, and now we're learning that there's, there's memories can be passed down through multiple generations through like what's called epigenetics. So like three generations ago, if your parents were like affected by the world war, uh, you know, if you're like grandparents or great grandparents were, then the genes get kind of modified so that you're born like on high alert, ready to respond to like fearful stuff. And that can sensitize people to trauma. And so, yeah, it's, it's far more than just remembering certain episodes. It's this whole, as you kind of say, like, what are we without, without this carryover through time that we could call memory? Yeah, that is, that is, that is very trippy because when, when you break it down and you say memory isn't just an indiv- individualistic thing, it's a, it's a collective thing. That is uh, hmm. that's a very profound idea. And also something else you touched on, how you said plants have memory. Like, can you expand more on that? Because when I think of memory, I think, I mean, I'm not, I don't know anything about like how the brain is set up, but I just think of neurons like you know, in our brain, but plants yeah. don't have a brain or a central nervous system. So how does that work? You're not the only one. It's, it's, this is kind of, um, we're on the brink of like a paradigm shift really with how we think about <clears throat> intelligence and memory and uh, consciousness, you know, there's, there is the, the, um, you know, it kind of comes out of the Western way of thinking that comes out of Christianity and Abrahamic religions where we're like, we're special and different to other animals. Um, and so neuroscience and like philosophy and then science got kind of infected by that way of thinking. So we look at our big brains and we say like these big brains are what are responsible for memory, intelligence, all this stuff. Um, and it turns out that was kind of, that's just like a not really, not really a correct way to look at it. Um, and if you look at where these processes arise, as far as I can see, they arrive with the life process. So from the very first single celled organism that came into existence, in order to survive and not fall apart like all the non-living things, it has to integrate information over time, it has to have memories, it has to act intelligently. Um, And so I very much see uh, all of these things as part of the life process. And my, one of my kind of main academic contributions is something called the living mirror theory of consciousness, which basically argues that um, consciousness arises with the life process. It doesn't require neurons, it doesn't require, you know, mammalian brains it just requires life which is um you know living things are always these like we're always these enclosed systems like you know we have skin and our cells have membranes and that's because they're always trying to like survive effectively they're trying to cordon off their insides from the rest of the world and keep themselves going and they do that with memory and intelligence and also i'm arguing consciousness um and so yeah, it's, it's a bit of a perspective shift and mainstream academia is still struggling with it. People who are studying, there are people who are studying plants and plant intelligence. And so to answer your actual question, yeah, there, there's, there are people who've done experiments. Monica Gagliano in um, Sydney is one of the main people who's done this, where they look at things like uh, habituation, which is how you kind of adapt to things over time. So when you put on your t-shirt, you feel it on your skin, but right now, until I mention it, you're not consciously aware of it, right? Your mm. the nerve cells adapt because it's it, the, nothing's changing. It's not important. So it filters it out. That's a form of memory that it turns out plants have. Um, and so they do things, they also do kind of conditioning where like you have a stimulus associated with a threat, like they drop the, there's a plant where they drop it and the leaves close in like a defensive thing. And so I, I, I hope I don't get this wrong, but it's the kind of experiment where it's like you play, um, I think they might use sound, but so say there's like a vibration in the air, they drop the plant, it closes up. Eventually they close up when they feel the vibration in the air. So that's like, that's intelligent learning to associate different things and, and respond intelligently to, to it. So there's this whole field of plant intelligence now, um, which is sometimes called plant neurobiology, which is kind of funny because they don't have neurons, as you said, but that, that points to the fact that they actually have the same, largely they have the same genes and the same chemicals and the same things that make up neurons. And so there's nothing, there's nothing magical about neurons. I think there's something very flexible about them. Like they're really good at processing information, but chemical reactions in plants can also process information. Um, so yeah, I think we're on the brink of, of a real perspective change in how we think about this stuff. That's, that's extremely interesting. Cause so it's not really episodic memory. It's just memory that is, it's just right. uh, essentially just reactions the chemical reactions, which I actually saw something uh, um, a few days ago about how, I don't know where, what it was, where it was. It was something how 
it was some headline i didn't read it. it was that our universe is a giant neural network so when you when you bring up topics like that it makes sense that like when you put it in the way you're like yes this is just one giant neural network of uh chemical and reactions that are just reacting in an in infinite amount of ways it's like we're, we're living in this giant processor a giant uh brain that is just unfolding upon itself it's uh so it's, it, do you know anything about that uh that neural like this whole universe is a neural network idea yeah um there's i think it's a visualization of it's either dark matter or dark energy i'm not a physicist so i can't even pretend to know really what the difference is but um mm -hmm. i uh there's there's this image yeah of where it, you it has the same kind of structure as as a neural network um and i was even shown this in when i was an undergrad they had these two things side by side um yeah i think it's something where i think you so I, I don't i wouldn't say the universe is a brain like i think there's a there's a strong temptation to go there and say like this is the mind of the universe you know um but to me what it points to is kind of um that there are certain patterns in nature that um arise again and again and it reminds us that we really are part of nature you know mm -hmm. we're not these separate things that it, neurons are not like um, yeah, something categorically different to the rest of nature. Um, and so when we open our eyes in the morning and we take in the world around us, it really is the universe that's becoming conscious of itself, you know, like it's, uh, we are fully part of it. And so it's, yeah, that's what it reminds me is that, is that we're part of a natural process. It's, it's not, I don't think it's possible to know what's going on with that structure. I mean, it also looks quite similar to um the way light scatters through underwater like if you look at the bottom of a swimming pool there's a certain kind of way it scatters so yeah it could who knows like why it's that structure it could be meaningful or it might not be um but it's definitely even my lecturers as an undergrad couldn't couldn't resist putting it up and just being like whoa <laughs> like it's a very <laughs> without really making much of a point it, it definitely gives you a kind of yeah another mm -hmm. kind of trippy feeling i guess <laughs> so you're saying the universe is um it, how do I phrase this? It works. It's it's pretty much the patterns of the universe are are similar throughout the like no matter what where what what the organism is how large the object is or small it is it's just it's following the same pattern almost like the Fibonacci sequence it's like it's following uh, the same like mathematical patterns and it doesn't matter if it's a neuron or if it's this other chemical reaction it's still following that yeah. same pattern. Yeah, I, mean, I think, yeah, we're, we're seeing, um, I mean, what is actually technically is a fractal, which is um, self-similarity, which is like, um, you know, a tree has this branching structure. If you look at its leaf, the veins have a branching structure. Um, and when you have, so you have the same patterns emerging at different scales. And that's a feature of complex systems that are usually kind of self-organized to a kind of in a very kind of balanced way um and yeah as you say kind of like these kind of mathematical sequences you get you can see these same kinds of patterns emerging um you've just made me think of something i've not thought of before which is if you see those patterns at the scale of the universe like if we're seeing self-similarity between us and the you know our smaller structures and the larger structures in the universe that suggests that the universe might also be a kind of self-organizing system like a, like a life form that's found some critical balance in order to exist yeah um yeah instead of just being this dumb explosion of stuff and then you get a bit of intelligence over here perhaps the whole thing has that kind of um that order. kind of structure like yeah that's interesting there seems to be yeah. some kind of order if you like when you put it that way there seems it's not there's random events because if there is patterns throughout no matter where, where it is no the locality doesn't matter like it's the same pattern throughout and we're just we're yeah. not we are part of the pattern it, there seems to be some kind of order and that's what cosmos means right in greek isn't it doesn't that just mean order hmm. i'm not know. sure but, but i wouldn't be surprised but I yeah i mean it, it gives it slightly gives me the feeling yeah, of like if you were, if you were, if you were one of the um, bacteria, bacterium living in our in our guts, and you think you're the only kind of self-organized living system, and then you might be surprised that it turns out that you're living in an even bigger self-organizing system, which we call a human. 
um, it slightly gives me that feeling of like, oh, like maybe it makes sense that we could only find ourselves inside another thing that has the same kind of structure. Mm. You know, you um, there's just it's kind of the same thing all the way down. Yeah, mm. it's an interesting idea. Definitely an interesting concept. And then, but then you get into the quantum world and then quantum mechanics, and it's just like it throws all that out the window. It's like patterns, and I don't, I don't know. I'm not gonna act like I know anything about quantum mechanics, yeah. but I, I know the stuff that I have learned, and and. And I, it, I realize that it just throws like, you know, classical physics out the window. So it's just, who knows? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's funny because my, my main takeaway of the quantum stuff, which isn't something, a perspective that's argued for much, I think, is to not be that worried about it, <laughs> which is kind of like, I think, um, you know, our, our, our models of the world, our experience of the world emerged at this scale to understand certain things like navigating in 3D space, um, communicating with other humans all this kind of stuff and classical physics works well at this scale and then if it turns out the very fabric of reality operates in a kind of different way that we we just can't get our heads around because we didn't evolve to make sense of it that's kind of fine by me like I can imagine you know it's, it's this huge crazy buzz of energy where you can't even put into words you can say things like things exist in multiple places at the same time, but what does that even mean? Like, yeah. it just points to the fact our language is breaking down. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite happy to be like, I exist here as this biological thing. I understand this world. Um, the foundation of reality is is something utterly beyond me, um, as it, which is as it should be. I remember being a kid and learning about the idea of atoms. I just found it so dissatisfying. I was like, surely like all of existence isn't just made of little like Lego bricks. Like that doesn't sound right. Like mm -hmm. there's just these little bricks and you're just a little thing made of, of bricks and like these atoms and that's it. Even then I was like, nah, that's not, that's not what existence is. You know? yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to me that it might be something a bit harder to make sense of than that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, the conclusion of it all is like when you, you can do as many psychedelics as you want, you can think as much as you want and do as many mathematical proofs as you want. But when it comes down to it, our, we're still monkeys. And we still don't yeah. really, we have, our brains only have a certain amount of computing power to the, to the universe that we live in. And uh, getting back to the original point of where we started kind of was like, it's just, just uh, every label that you put on this universe is just taking you further away from the current moment, which is, right. you know, the truth. So, I mean, right. it's fun to have those, you know, you know, like this conversation and it's fun to have, you know, those, those thought games that you, that we all play because, I don't, I don't know why that's just what our brain does but the, the truth of the matter is, is there's really the, the only truth you can come to is that we'll never really know the truth like no rationally it's just a simple fact of just existing and that's that's the point of buddhism and you know the hinduism eastern philosophies that they try to take us closer and closer to that that truth of the the present moment but our monkey mind just gets us right. lost I'm, I'm with the everything yeah. that's going on outside and bills and drama but when it comes down to it man we just have to just still the mind and meditate right <laughs> i think so i mean like that's it's really it really balances us out if we if we take experience and just you know by which i mean just kind of meditation just engaging with experience if we take that as the main kind of meat of existence um and then we can play these other games of understanding but if we understand that it's 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 a you know, it's a fun game like science and philosophy. I love it. It's, it's, you know, but it is a game. It's, yeah. it's a successful game and, and it's, and it's useful and it, and it can be reassuring to understand the world and it can be beautiful to look at the elegance of something like evolution or, you know, all of these things. Um, but it's, it's a map and it's, and it's a, a thing you can do to entertain yourself and achieve some good and help people, but it's not the meat of existence, you know? And so this is why I'm kind of passionate about arguing for, mm -hmm. Um, this kind of synthesis of science and spirituality because you know like I was brought up th to feel like the scientific worldview well I think I, I had two things from from the start it was clear that this wasn't the actual scientific worldview the scientific worldview doesn't really say anything on, on meaning but that there in the culture there's this idea that science says science says that the world is kind of nigh it's like a nihilistic picture where you're this lonely thing and you're meaningless and turns out love is a chemical reaction in your brain, which means it's, it's pointless and material. And you thought you were in love, but it turns out it's all just meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is just categorically wrong and based on a lot of assumptions and illusions that don't stand up to science. 
like the idea that you are an ego, you are a kind of an identity inhabiting this mechanical body. Um, all of that like, doesn't actually stand up to truth, whereas the, the kind of naturalistic elements that are common to a lot of Eastern religions in particular, yeah, where, where you realize that ultimately reality is this huge process and you're part of it and the felt states are real by their own measure like love isn't cashed out in chemicals love is cashed out in the feeling of love like and that is real <laughs> like yeah. you can't there's nothing you could there's nothing you could map about my brain and my behavior and you know no map ever dismisses the territory um you know like if if you were having a great day at the beach and then i say to you i show you the beach on google maps and i say oh no look it's just a position in time it's just a position in space and i have it all mapped here you didn't actually have a good day at the beach you weren't actually at the beach you'd be yeah. like that's nonsense you know but <laughs> we find it hard to, to see with with science yeah um, yeah that's a that's a that's a great metaphor um fair, yeah that's awesome you must um okay so i, I think that's so important to be able to ride the line between the crazy hokey spirituality and the you know the the hard rationale like you know this is it this is how it is and i think it's very important for people like you and people that have the name and the phd to to ride that line and to say like no we can blend these two and there is uh there is there is a, a certain symbiosis between the two that we can we can find out the truth and it lies in between them so I think what you're doing is extremely important, man. So just, you know, keep doing your thing. Um, you. Do you have a lot of like uh, people, because, all right, so let me ask you first, uh, what psychedelics have you done? Like what, what have you done to explore the inner depths of our mind? Yeah. So my exploration with psychedelics began when I was in my kind of, I guess, late twenties, I think. Um, and I, so I'd had this kind of what would probably be called a mystical experience as a teenager um, and of just kind of dropping into the present moment and feeling kind of liberated from suffering. It was like this blissful state. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went and studied neuroscience. And um, then when I, and then kind of meditated. Can I stop you once was, that, and, was the teenager yeah. thing, was that induced by any chemical? Or was that just something like, because Ramana no, no, Maharshi no. just had this like moment where he just like, whoa, I'm alive. And you felt like he was dying. So yeah. it was just one day you just like came to this like weird ego death. Yeah. So I, I think it was a very similar experience to what someone like Ramana Maharshi experienced, but I'm not putting myself on the same <laughs> level as him because I think in the 20th century, he is potentially the, the best candidate for someone who was fully like enlightened someone who just woke yeah. up got it and he just like didn't speak for years and like you know because <laughs> yeah but i think i had i had a glimpse of the same state which is so what happened for me was i was raised catholic and i now understand i didn't realize at the time but there's just a lot of intergenerational trauma and and kind of you know family stress stuff um and so i was a very kind of conscientious guilt-ridden kid and so i was 13 and and i was taking this worldview of like hell after death too seriously, basically. But I was, I was being told, you know, by, it, it wasn't like fundamentalist or anything, but I was just being told at school, at my kind of Catholic school, um, that, you know, if that there was this benevolent God who had created me and required me to have blind faith. And even then I was very kind of rationalisty kind of kid. Um, mm -hmm. And if I didn't have blind faith magically, even though he created me without it, I needed to magic, magically have it. And, but if I didn't, he would torture me for infinity. So I really needed to do it, but he'd made me without it. But he was benevolent, but he was gonna to torture me. And like, I just went around and around and around. And I was, I was getting genuinely stressed by this. I think I was probably channeling a lot of emotional trauma and stuff into it. Um, and I was, I was getting so worked up, I was just on a bus. And I think my rational mind just exhausted itself. It just couldn't find a solution and it just stopped. And when it stopped, there was just utter peace. And it was like, I was seeing the world around me kind of perfectly clearly for the first time and it was this intuitive apprehending of you know now i can i try to put it into words but it's, it's really hard to but in an instant there's this feeling of existent bare existence in the present moment before you think before you label things it's it's blissfully perfect there's nothing wrong in the present moment um if you're really paying attention and we see this with like the monks who set themselves on fire in protest they knew this right they could they realize that even if you're on fire, if you just pay attention to what it feels like, it doesn't, it's not intrinsically, pain isn't intrinsically uh, linked to suffering. You can actually break that thing. It's thought that mediates suffering. So 
if you just if you're just here in the present and you just pay attention that's what it is in like buddhism i think to wake up and and that's what enlightenment is it's just this like the fact that consciousness is just this like their appearances they don't add, and then we add the meaning later yeah. um so that that for me in an instant cured me of i never for a second worried again about about catholic dogma dogma because i i realized in an instant that it was just people saying things it was just yeah. stories it was and and actually if I pay attention, what's true is this. This existence right now is true. And I can think about other stuff, but then, but from that perspective, I was like, well, clearly there's this natural world. If someone's telling me there's something else, like pff, that, I, they're probably just telling me something because they want me to believe it for some control reason. Like, I don't need to believe them. So anyway, so that was what happened as a teenager. Um, and then when I was, yeah, in my late twenties, there was a, so Johns Hopkins, university has been doing psychedelic research since there was a paper in 2006 looking at psilocybin you know the active chemical magic mushrooms um high doses of that producing mystical experiences in people and i recognized in the write-up they were kind of quantifying these mystical experiences and i realized that this was the same thing you know same thing that i'd had um and so i became interested in that and i also became interested in, in i've been reading about people microdosing psilocybin mushrooms and I was experiencing kind of winter depression. And at the time I thought it was to do with living very far north. It, like in England, it gets incredibly dark and gloomy in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably a big part of it, but I now think it's, it was due to this kind of burbling emotional trauma stuff under the surface as well. So um, I decided to grow my, grow my own. Um, you know, it's, it's legal to, to get the spores and it's legal to, to just have all the stuff. You're just not allowed to grow it and eat it. But I decided that civil mm -hmm. disobedience was going to be fine um, <laughs> for this thing that, you know, has been proven to be non-toxic and helpful and stuff. Yeah. So I, um, my first my first attempt was a, was a heroic dose, five dried grams. Actually, it was 50 fresh grams because it's there's like a 10 percent, yeah. like the 90 percent water. Mm -hmm. So um, so I I. Yeah, I did that and immediately was like, yep, this is the same. Well, a few hours later, I was like, this takes you to the same state, but with a lot happening, you know, like it kind of forces you into that state and holds you there um, in a way that's quite intense and overwhelming. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of visuals and things as well. Um, but, but that came out of a feeling of, by that point, I'd barely spoken to anyone in my entire life about this mystical experience. It was like the most important thing that ever happened to me, but, but I, I just knew you know, studying science and like, if, if I say everything I just said to you now, in the first instance, people might just think you've gone crazy or they just don't won't know what you're talking about. Um, or another fear I had was that people would think I was like claiming to be enlightened or something that, you know, people would, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the same thing to, to, to kind of, there's a range of, you know, ways people can access these states. And um, so, yeah, there was just a lot of reservation around it. But I, I very much felt like I wanted more people to have access to this stuff. You know, I didn't want people to have to wait for spontaneous mystical experiences to happen because of stress and trauma and, or, you know, fasting for months or doing <laughs> yoga for years or meditating for, you know, um, mm -hmm. because I, th I thought it really helps people to wake up out of suffering and, and can show people why meditation makes sense and, and all this stuff. So that's why I, I was excited to try it. Um, and then... I found that basically more intermediate, normal kind of doses of like two to three dried grams. Um, it started to, alongside, you know, at the peak of these experiences, I'd have, I'd be, you know, in these kinds of ego death, non-dual states for a long time. But what I found was on the way up and down, um, emotional material would come out, memories would, would surface, bodily sensations associated with the memories would come up. And that was mind blowing to me. And that, that's when I realized that there was a lot to the idea of plant medicine and, and healing with the stuff. And there was just a lot of like moments of like <laughs> realizing the traumatic things that happened to me that I just kind of shrugged off and assumed was fine, that clearly they'd, they'd stayed in the system. And that was what was precipitating these kinds of periods of depression. Um, so then I went on a long period of, of basically just, just uh, confronting my shadow material, releasing it. Um, and I moved on to using LSD, which I found was really powerful for like bodily experiences. So I, I, I would just kind of, and this is always, I would have a playlist of music and I'd be wearing an eye mask and I'd be my, by myself with my phone off and very intentional. Um, and yeah, there were these things called these trauma releasing exercises associated with Peter Levine, who's a uh, psychologist who came up with this thing called somatic experiencing. And I found that 
um, yeah, I could I could take a kind of standard dose of LSD, put on this music, go into my mind, and when kind of when challenging material came up, just I would be breathing deeply and I would just let my body kind of shake it off, um, which is a kind of physiological way to discharge trauma that's been stored in the body. <clears throat> and so I went from having, you know, I've been diagnosed with asthma and eczema and irritable bowel syndrome and, and all these things, and they all resolved, they've all gone away now because I spent a long time just, there was all this stress energy in my body from a very young age and it turned out what I needed to do was just release it and just shake it out. Um, I say just, it was the most challenging thing I've ever done is to go in day after, you know, day and, and confront this, this, this very deep emotional material. Mm. Um, so that led to a long process, a lot of kind of grieving as well, kind of experiencing sadness and simultaneously improving my emotional health by like um, putting healthy boundaries with friends and family members and, you know, like really thinking consciously about what my, my life needed to look like to have for me to be in a state of emotional health moved into the middle of the, the mountains with my wife that I'm now based in um yeah in Portugal uh but I commute to London um so uh, w my life changed a lot because it turns out if you want to uh, you know I, I now think we think of mental health issues as these kinds of disorders that are contained and that you know you could be a person with this extra thing that's a mental health issue but now I think of it as we all have our emotional dynamics and they're inherently connected to the people around us. And if you're going to be emotionally healthy, it actually requires real world change. It requires you to physically change the way you relate to your body. It requires you to change the way you interact with people in your life. And um, the kind of, maybe the kind of work you do, you know, engaging in meaningful activity. Um, so yeah, that it led to a long process of that. Um, on the way, this is a long answer, but you did ask about what's the whole kind of, all you want, of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so then after a while, I, um, I'd, so I, at the start of this kind of adventure, I guess I, um, around then I, I'd come up with this theory of consciousness that was to do with, with the life process. And it made me think that, so my mind went to the idea of, we were talking about plant intelligence, intelligence in nature. And I was thinking about the fact that to me, it seems clear that something like psilocybin mushrooms you know they they have in they they've evolved a repertoire of behaviors to interact with other species they could kill species you know with toxins or they can tempt them to engage in kind of symbiosis and and it, to me it's clear that they are they are acting on us in a way that is serving some kind of function for them evolutionarily whether it's you know trying to it might just be kind of reining us into kind of eco awareness which will benefit them because they they really hold the ecosystem together but I was reflecting on that of just the intelligence in nature and how our culture is really shut off to it. And we, we see plants and fungi as just these dumb, inert things, but they're actually very alive and, and acting on us. And I saw a talk by Dennis McKenna um, who, where he'd spoken about the idea that DMT, which is a very powerful psychedelic that's found in our bodies and throughout nature, that the idea, the idea was that DMT might function as a kind of a, what he called a neurotransmitter for the Gaian mind. So a neurotransmitter is are the chemicals that signal between brain cells and Gaia is James Lovelock's idea that the whole ecosystem can be understood as a, as a self-organizing, self-balancing organism effectively. So he's like, you know, maybe we are components in this bigger mind. And so that made me think, well, I'm fascinated to see if these visions you have with DMT might be an insight into plant intelligence and the way nature is acting on us. So I had the opportunity to try pure DMT and I had the kind of classic experience, which was not <laughs> at all what I was expecting. Um, you know, whereas with psilocybin LSD, I experienced mystical union, this kind of state of very kind of Eastern states of, of, of being one with the universe, which I see as being very easy to square with science. Uh, the DMT experience, you feel like you reality unzips and you find yourself in some place that you feel like you've been before. And it feels like it's behind the scenes of reality. And it's like, that's the place where we all come from and go back to. And it's this wacky cartoonish place with like aliens running around and interacting with you and be like, hi, James, good to see you again. And, <laughs> and it's the most real thing you've ever experienced. And then you're kind of catapulted back into your body and it zips up and you're, you're just left 
with what's called ontological shock, which is like just being like, wait a minute, what's real? Like, mm -hmm. how how do I know? Like that felt more real than this feels. There's actually been a study that came out this year from Johns Hopkins where they interviewed people who did DMT and they found that on average people rate it as 50% more real than this reality, the experience. <laughs> so where we are now feels two thirds as real as the DMT experience. <laughs> so it's a, it's a common thing that people experience. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard that from, yeah. it's all the same story of the DMT. I've never done it myself, but it's, I've talked yeah. to so many people that have, and it's all the same story. Like what you just described, yeah. how it's this, it's realer than real. Um, it seems that like the, it's like the source energy from where we came and where we're going. And um, there's, there's, there's other entities there and you leave your body. And uh, I, I, I spoke to somebody yesterday and they said the same exact thing as you. And it's, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's similar. Like all it's very awesome. it's, 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 um, it's just, I guess it's just like this alien. I don't know. Like I said, I can't speak on it. I don't think anybody can really speak on it, but it's just, it just seems to be right, this yeah. alien molecule that is, I mean, from the description of it, it seems like some kind of messenger for, I guess, like you said, a neurotransmitter of the guy in mind, it seems to be some kind of messenger that's showing us something. I know when no, I'm I mean, on, on a- Immediately- uh, Go ahead, you, you can go. Sorry, you go. No, I, I insist, there's gonna be a delay, otherwise we'll keep talking to each other. <laughs> okay, so I, when, I know when I'm on high doses of psilocybin, I say that, um, that like this, there's no way that this is an accident. Like there's no way that this is just like, this. this feeling is, is it's just like, it's just random. It seems like there's something, some kind of entity, some kind of intelligence that's trying to communicate and send its, uh, it's some kind of signal to me, whether, I don't know what it is, who it is, but it's, it's, it's like a signal of, of, of just like love, compassion, unity, uh, just understanding. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's certain elements that I get out of that experience. And, to me, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I like to try and keep it rational and, you know, like one plus one equals two, but it's, it's to me, it just seems like there's some, it was, it seems like they're here for a reason. And it, which, you know, yeah. it seems to be that we're living through this psychedelic Renaissance at the most, at the craziest time in human history. It doesn't seem like a, an accident that these things are coming about. And, and, you know, we have thousands, if not millions of people, or, or we're going to have millions of people going through this experience for that reason. So we can, come to experience that get that that chemical message from wherever or whoever whatever like we'll get the message and then we change as a species ideally that's what it seems like to me yeah yeah i think um especially with you know i i think of um dmt is probably the kind of the prototypical psychedelic in the sense that it's an ancient molecule that has existed before we did it's so widespread in nature and I feel like our evolution, you know, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's not like these chemicals are, can just be kind of invented and used for a very specific purpose in us. It's like we evolve in this context, this soup of like stuff, you know, in the same way that we, you know, like most of the cells in our body are bacteria and there are like fungal cells in our body and stuff. And, you know, without the bacteria, we, we would die. So, it, you know, like there are biologists who say that we are like a pattern on the, the kind of um, the world of bacteria, you know, so, so it's the same with things like DMT and serotonin, they're in the mix, they're in the kind of ecosystem, they're in the kind of soup of, of biological existence, and then we form, and different organisms will use them for different purposes. So I'm interested in, in definitely in what DMT is doing in our organism, because we don't know, we don't know why it's inside us, we don't know why, you know, one of the most powerful psychedelics out there exists, seemingly, it, the evidence is pointing towards it existing in our brains in, in small amounts um so so yeah i think after the experience the your mind doesn't go to rational explanations it feels very much like that the kind of explanation that makes sense is oh i'm in a simulation right now and mm -hmm. i chose to come in here like you know we're actually living it like thousands of years in the future in a spaceship and we've <laughs> evolved into these weird like you know uh barely recognizable versions of ourselves and we come into this simulation for fun to remember what it was like on earth um <laughs> those are the kinds of things that fit best with the experience or like um maybe aliens like uh you know put this in our like 
like put it into our nervous system so that it's like a switch that turns on our brain and our brain's a radio receiver for all this material that they send to us. That's the kind of thing that it feels like. Um, but for me, like as a scientist, my world, you know, there's, that stuff is so outside of my current, my conception of, of, of what's real that I actually can't do much good work with that. So like, there's so much that hangs together in my worldview that, that does work in terms of thinking of us as these like evolved creatures, not as having souls that can go to some immaterial plane. So I've been doing a lot of work to try and come up with um, what you might describe as a kind of scientific rational picture of what's going on without recourse to the more wacky ideas. Um, I've come up with something that I'm fairly pleased with that, that makes me feel like it is truly coming from within us. Um, and the general vibe is one of it being like a kind of an evolved kind of like archetypal program for engage, like, cause we're social creatures. So I think it makes sense that our brain has the capacity to project entities. It's, they seem so real when you have the experience, but like right now there's just some pixels on the screen, but I vividly am perceiving you as an entity, as a being, as mm -hmm. another organism in front of me. Um, and that's quite a trick. Like, you know, there's just some pixels here, but yeah. like, you know, our usual perception you can think of as a kind of controlled hallucination. My brain clearly has the ability to project like there is an entity in front of you. Mm. Um, so I do think we might come down with, with those kinds of explanations, but some part of me thinks, you know, like, um, there's not, it's, it's the only thing in reality that basically makes me think like perhaps perhaps there is something really weird about to be discovered about our reality and we're not thinking about it the right way. Um, you know, like with something like telepathy, if someone tells me they, that there's like parapsychologists have evidence of telepathy, I'm inclined to think if it existed, it would have been shown by now because it'd be quite easy to show. You could, you know, if it like, you could run an experiment next week with some participants and win a Nobel Prize if you can actually show it. If you can show it like significantly in the data, you would you would win a Nobel Prize, and it wouldn't take much. You would just take some people in a room and making notes and stuff. Mm. So I'm in, I'm inclined to think that it's most likely that's some glitch of the human mind that makes people believe, think that stuff happens. And so it's, it's very rare for me to think that there's something that will overturn our conception of, of reality. But the DMT thing reminds me that you know, we live inside paradigms and we truly believe they're real. You know, we really used to believe that we were at the center of the universe. And then suddenly you get this huge flip and you're like, whoa, we're not at the center at all. Um, we used to believe the universe was a certain size. Then we, every decade, we're discovering it's much vaster than we thought. Um, we used to believe we were separate to the animal, to other animals. Then we just, we realized we were evolved from other animals and that, that our deep, deep ancestors were slugs and, you know, single cell bacteria. Um, all of these things are like, unimaginable before they turn out to be true yeah. and i so i i'm not you know i i don't think so i'm i'm not inclined to take anything and experience literally so this is like the mystical experience i had showed me that like i may think that like this is a glass but actually if i think about it glasses a glass that word glass is a concept and, you know, if I melt this down into liquid glass, like at what point is it no longer a glass? You can realize that glasses don't exist as objects. They exist, that's like a term we use. So my perception is kind of tricking me when I believe there is essence of glass in that glass. And so I think it would be astounding if it turned out that the DMT experience was literally real, like in the sense of there are literal entities and you came from simulation or anything like that. Um, so that makes me, yeah, me doubt that. But I do think... I, I I don't dismiss people who who are utterly convinced that there's something our, our our scientific picture of the world needs some changing in order to make sense of of these kinds of experiences. I'm not mm -hmm. fully dismissing that. Yeah, and that's why it's important for people like you to to go through these experiences. Like, are there people in your field that also are involved uh, in with the psychedelics, or do they just dismiss I mean, it altogether? There are people doing I mean, there are people doing great research now. Um, it's not common for people to to kind of, you know, talk about it in the way that I'm talking about it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not running the clinical experiments or anything. I'm doing it out of intellectual curiosity and for health, like kind of, you know, emotional health reasons. Um, so it's not, it's, there's not a culture of people doing these things, but you do have like people who run the experiments in 
so at Imperial College in London, where they're doing a lot of them, they're doing some DMT trials. And I recently interviewed one of the lead therapists there for the psilocybin trials, and she underwent, it, it, she was a participant in one of the DMT trials and spoke to me about her experience. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, I really enjoyed talking to that because she's a very, you know, deeply qualified uh, kind of therapist who is clearly very level-headed, but had, has these, had these wacky experiences as well. Um, so yeah, there's not that many of us, but um, there are some of us. And um, I, I think it's a shame that more people haven't had these experiences because it's, you know, I think when people try something like DMT in particular, but probably psychedelics in general, there's this feeling of how did society manage to keep this a secret? Like, it's astounding that like, everyone's not talking about this, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so I think that is a shame and, and I'm looking forward to that changing as these things, as the medicinal use of these things gets kind of rolled out more. Mm, yeah, 100%. I would think that like, um, if you're in that field of the mind, whether it be psychology, neurology or neuroscience or, you know, any study of the mind that you would, you know, you would have to study right. these, what these things are because they're so alien and they're so crazy. Like Timothy Leary said that his first psilocybin trip, he learned more about the, the mind than he did in his, yeah. uh, in his all, all of his years of schooling. So it's just, it's yeah, just yeah. so weird to me that, you know, if you're all about the mind and, you know, that's your whole, your whole life's work is about the brain and the mind don't you want to see the craziest thing that ever happened in the mind? Like, don't you want to experience that or at least be open-minded about what that is? Like, it, yeah. There's know. something very weird that's, that's happened in Western academia. I think it's something to do with like the professionalization of these jobs where they're like, you know, like we live in an economy where it's like, you have to be able to, to just kind of turn up clock in nine to five and do it in this very like, um, yeah, like, a way that's stripped of of passion, I guess. Like Alan Watts, uh, I remember hearing a lecture of him talk about how philosophers in the West now, you you know, it's a, again, it's a job where you, you clock in and out and you debate some very narrow particular thing. And, and he was arguing for kind of a revival of awe and the fact that if you're a philosopher, you should really be thinking about the big questions of existence of meaning and, and you know, and engaging with 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 states of, of awe at, as opposed to saying, no, get rid of the awe, let's do kind of analytical, logical puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for science, the same thing is true. You know, a hundred years ago, um, we had this, you know, so you had you had kind of Freud and, and, and that stuff, but then that gave way to behaviorism, which was like a super stripped back thing of like, forget about any experience let's just study behavior because that's scientific and rigorous and we can we can do that in a kind of quantifiable way um and that tradition really i mean it's kind of crazy you know that that people got caught up in that anyway that somehow you i, I don't i don't really understand what kind of person wants to be a psychologist only to dismiss the mind and say <laughs> let's only look at behaviors you know yeah. but um but they exist so yeah there's this weird tradition in the in the west of of doing doing these studying these things in, in quite a, a shallow way i guess which can lead to a lack of real engagement with the stuff of, that's important um yeah which is another reason why i i, I kind of talk openly about this stuff because i think it, i should be allowed to do this that i should be able to eat a mushroom that grows just naturally and is safer than a cup of coffee physiologically mm -hmm. um, and we know from the research can be taken extremely reliably uh, in a way that does there's no risk of like bad trips if you do it you know like in the clinical studies that no one has bad trips because there's it's done in a safe environment that's intentional I've never had a bad trip um, and also there's this, when you use them for personal growth there's this understanding that you're going in to clear out shadow material and so if a, if a challenging memory comes up it's like oh great now I can breathe through this and shake it out and release it if you have if that's your attitude you can't have a bad trip unless you took a, like a too high a dose and lost your bearings and got overwhelmed but that's very easy to control as well just don't do that just take it easy and you know mm -hmm. so um so it's it's very clear to me that there's no health reason for someone like me to not do these things and the only reason that they're illegal you know was, was to do with a kind of cultural backlash of a culture of control that didn't want people you know uh, objecting to the vietnam war and the kind of lsd you know associated with the hippies um but yeah i, th I think it's um I, I guess I'm, I'm being the change I want to see in the world. I'm trying to, you know, exactly. hopefully there'll be more people who will, will talk about this stuff openly. 
Definitely, man. You have the ability to reach a lot of people that need to be reached just because of your, you know, your, uh, your credentials. Like you are, you're not just some guy that's going to raves, taking mushrooms. Like, you know, you are, you are a legit guy in the, in the eyes of people that don't know what these are. They're, they're more apt to listen to you than they are to me, or they're listening to some guy that's got long hair and wearing tie dye. So yeah, it's definitely very important for you to speak about those things. And everybody, everybody who has these experiences to speak about the, the benefits that they get, because there's so many, there's millions if not billions of people around the globe that could be helped by these uh, these plant medicines that are, you know, like you said, they grow on the earth. They, they're here naturally. Like, And I think it's a crime against humanity. I legitimately think it's a crime against humanity yeah, I agree. For, for them to be illegal. And we will look back. Humanity yeah. will look back. I'm saying this on camera right now. Mark my words. We'll look back. And we, people will look back and be like, what was wrong with that society in 2020 yeah. on September 21st? And what, why, why are the plants illegal? That doesn't even make any sense. Like we are just, we're living in, in just such an archaic old style and system yeah. of, of, um, of how we treat these things. And it's, it's, it's potentially, it could save lives. Like I, before I took Absolutely. psilocybin, I was, I was depressed. I was having suicidal thoughts. And then I took a large dose and I realized so many things and so many revelations about life. And it kind of like switched me around. And it, I guess you can say it, it inadvertently saved my life. So like there's probably- yeah, I'm in the same position. There's, there's probably millions of people out there. I know there are. What's the, the, one of the biggest ec- epidemics out there other than the coronavirus? It's mental health. And so yeah. <laughs> we have these things that are so benign that don't hurt us whatsoever. Um, they might just be a little intense, but you know, that's kind of how they have to be. And they have the potential to heal our world. And yet they're, you know, if you're caught growing them or you have a possession of like an eighth, you could go to jail for a long time. Like it's so backwards. Yeah, yeah. What is going on? <laughs> like, yeah. It's insanity. And it's I because mean, they're looped in my... with drugs. They're, they're drugs. It's the yeah. it's a drug, but we have to we have to take the label off these things as drugs. It's not. It is a drug, I guess it is, but it's not. It's not. Methamphetamine is a drug, you know. Crack cocaine is a drug, and psilocybin is a drug. Like it's it doesn't. We should come up with different labels for how we Absolutely, classify yeah. these things. I mean, so, coffee is a drug as well, right? But people yeah. that doesn't feel right. People in the same way we go, well, it's technically a drug, but it's not really a drug. That's how people should feel about ayahuasca. It's a, it's a like a potion, basically. You know, it's yeah. not a drug. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's so in the same way. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, there's a fungus that can change, can have an effect on your mind. But zooming in, going ah, but it contains a chemical that has an effect on me in the same way like caffeine has an effect on me. Is yeah, I think we do need more different terminology. But yeah, I think I, th- I completely agree with the, you know, um, it, it's so deeply wrong that these things, that people can't have access to these things because people are killing themselves every day from like PTSD. And yeah. we, we we're seeing that MDMA, psilocybin, ayahuasca, these things can cure it in a way that nothing else can at the moment. So every day these things, you know, we're losing people um, every day that these things aren't accessible. And I feel like the only... The only way I can make sense of why these things are illegal is, is that kind of as a species, I think we're carrying a lot of collective trauma. Like every everyone has like their own kind of emotional stuff going on and humans evolved in small groups where they would use plant medicines in kind of shamanic rituals, I think in a way to emotionally balance individuals and the community to kind of you know, keep allow people to release trauma and come into harmony and and be a kind of a balanced superorganism effectively. And we don't do that anymore. And instead, we have this focus on individuals, which allows people who are deeply traumatized, carrying a lot of pain. You know, one thing that happens when when people have a lot of suppressed trauma is you get these these things like um, psychopathy, sociopathy, and and narcissism, which are all kind of where you're kind of, you know, encrusted in your own ego and you're, as a result, you're like, you're so self-protected that you're hostile to other people and you're, you're, you lose your empathy and you, you feel so defensive that you want control and power. And so I, I see those forces in the world, the kind of, the, 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 the kind of networks of, of people who are thinking in that mode, who are not thinking in terms of 
how can we best improve life on earth? How can we have empathy for these people who are suffering? But people who are like, fuck everyone else, I'm feeling wounded. I, you know, they're not thinking this consciously, but they're, you know, the Richard Nixons of the world, I doubt, were, were kind of, you know, mm -hmm. empathetic people who like you know i mean we know that from the, his recordings that he's just deeply racist horrible person yeah. but um <laughs> he um i think people like that um are the, yeah like that collective trauma and the, that way it manifests is the problem because those people don't want to go and do ayahuasca they don't want to to go and confront their traumas because you know i mean for most of us it's scary but for those mm -hmm. people it's the last thing they want to do for that personality type so this is what i think is the kind of the collective issue is is that there are lots of there's a critical mass of people like that and the trick the tricky thing is it's not it's not their fault you know it could have been any one of us any one of us could have been put in the situation where we were traumatized and put in that direction um so it's not their fault but the the trick is going to be how do we reach those people how do we help them to heal their own issues given that that's the last thing they want to do and they want to suppress this medicine um for other people um, I see that as as the challenge our, our species faces, basically. Um, and it's tricky because because they are the kind of people who want power, they have power and they get to set the rules. Yeah. Um, you know, the hippies of the world aren't aren't reaching kind of, you know, the level of being the president of the United States. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that that's my take um, as to why these things kind of aren't, aren't currently out there. Mm. The human mind is easily corrupted by power yeah we just need to we just need to you know sprinkle a little bit of psilocybin in, in the politicians coffees yeah and maybe that'll do <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know what'll do it It'll, it's just gonna have to be have to be people like us just speaking about our experiences and obviously we're level-headed people and people see other people will see that we're level-headed and you know we're articulate and that we're not just like these hippies going to raves or not that there's anything wrong with that but I'm just saying yeah. there, there are actual uses that you can get out of this. And if it just takes, like you said before, it just takes, we are the change that we want to see in the world. And uh, yeah. it's a slow process. It's happening. Like, you know, Canada just um, approved uh, psilocybin for, you know, psychotherapy uses. And uh, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the world, but shout out Canada. Cause that's, yeah. that's, that's how, that's how this thing needs to be approached. It's, I don't know if they should have psilocybin dispensaries like uh, marijuana. Cause I mean, I, I don't see, I don't think it would be horrible, but I don't know if everybody should be tripping on five grams of mushrooms, like, you know, on the weekends, I think it, yeah. it should, as we start off, it should be, we should approach it in a psychotherapy way where it's a controlled environment. Um, you know, we have trained individuals that are around the, the person who was, you know, taking the substance and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the right way yeah. to do it anyway, because it's all about, like we said before, it's all about the, the setting that you do it in, set and setting. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the traditional things. use of this, they were used by like, sh you know, shamans and, and stuff who, who have, and still are, who have kind of the wisdom of how to navigate this stuff. And they're not, you know, there aren't traditional cultures that just use these things recreationally for fun and just have everyone, yeah taking any random amount it's done in a very intentional way so yeah mm -hmm. I, can, I can totally imagine a way that this rolls out where whether it's kind of community centers where you have kind of group you know facilitators and stuff or psychotherapy you know i can imagine different things for different people um but in the very least i mean we do also it's insane to have it be illegal to grow these things yourself given that they're plants so the balancing thing is there's no way that should be illegal but then we should have a cultural practice where we're like yeah well in the same way that like drink driving we know how to say to our to our friends like don't do that that's you, you're being you know reckless if you do that if someone wants to you know we just need a culture where we're encouraging each other to do these things responsibly i think exactly it's just like you said it starts at the, it starts at the individual level and the biggest hypocrisy of the western world is how alcohol is this glorified you know, you can go down the street and buy, I don't know, how old do you have to be in the UK to buy? Is 18? 18, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, in the US is 21, but 18, yeah, you have to be 18 years old. You can go in and you can buy as much as you want and you can drink yourself to death, literally, like quite literally. Yeah. But we have these other things that can help people and, and you know, heal trauma. And But don't touch that. Mm -mm. that yeah. that'll, make you, that'll make you think crazy. 
it's it's yeah. it's hypocrisy it seems as though that our species has lost its way we've you know we started off in these these tribal um hunter gatherer uh societies of maybe i don't know 20 25 people I, I really don't know very small communities and you know you had the shaman you had the leader you had the you, hold, you had the whole tribal aspect but that's still in our dna like that's still in in us we, we are still those humans and we seem to have lost that and but we still have that in our, in us but we we've created the society around just i don't i don't know what it is it's just craziness hypocrisy just power but it seems to me within the last few years, maybe, I don't know, within the last five, 10 years, we're slowly moving toward back to that, that, that the, you know, the archaic revival, as Terrence McKenna says, like we're moving back to that state of the tribalism. It's like a collective tribalism. And, and with that, where it's the return of these tribal medicines. And I think that's so important because the shaman I don't know, but the shaman must have been so important to the tribe. Like he was the guy that had the answers. He was the guy, yeah. he was the medicine man. That's literally what they, they would call themselves as the medicine man. And when, when you neglect this, our, this collective tribe of human beings of seven and a half billion people of the medicine that was in, in us, you know, in, in, it, it's, it's going to create a sick tribe, a sick society. And that's where we are now. Yeah. It's, it's craziness. But I think yeah. we are moving toward... A better world i really do believe that like there's a lot of pessimism in the world but i'm optimistic and i see how there are slight changes in people like canada and people like um countries like canada and people like us that are going through these this slow process and people will see this and then hopefully change and it'll be an exponential change hopefully what do you think do you yeah, think we're I mean, moving I a better I world so i hope so i mean i my genuine feeling at the moment is that I can't call it really. I, I can very, very easily imagine us going down the same pattern that we're going down now and it being game over fairly soon. Mm. Um, I, you know what? I, I feel like, um, you know, if you, you put on the, uh, the DMT experience way of thinking, which is like, yeah, imagine if this is a simulation, like a kind of video game that we come into. The funny thing is, is that I feel like it's poised at exactly the right level of difficulty. If, the, if it was the save the world video game, yeah. I feel like it's like, if you played it 10 times, you would win it like once out of nine times. Like it's a, it's a hard game, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about where we're at now is like, there are lots of us who really want to get this right and to try to improve the world and make it sustainable and, have it be about human well-being rather than this runaway just distraction growth consumption you know which is which I, is what i see this kind of collective trauma like just fueling us into this insa this insanity where we forget that we're home already and like where are we going like you know it's, it's an illusion you mm -hmm. know it's very much like meditation where you you realize your monkey mind is just chasing relentlessly into the future and making you suffer in the present um, I think that whole culture is stuck in that kind of way of being because it, it can't face itself and, and confront, confront the trauma inside. So I, I'm, I think if there is a solution, it genuinely is getting these medicines to people and, and, and the associated psychological changes that happen, so, you know, increasing empathy and wanting people to collaborate and making people want to collaborate more. Um, yeah, and I, I think we spoke before about kind of complex self-organizing systems and um, one of the things about them is is that they're very robust they're very um you know like the brain is a complex self-organizing system and you can knock out whole regions of it and it's and it still works um there's no central kind of node that if you knock out the whole thing breaks down um you know memory is very much like this but with a hierarchy where you have power and top-down control you knock out the top of the hierarchy it crumbles it's it's incredibly fragile or yet you, if you if you if you have like a top-down, you know, system of control, if any one node goes against its its it orders that are being forced on it, it disrupts the whole thing. Mm. Um, so they're very, very fragile, and we currently have an incredibly hierarchical, top-down, control-based way of doing society, um, which wasn't what these communities were like before. They had no leader, you know, by and large, as far as we can see. These these kinds of hunter-gatherer societies, you just have communities of people, and as you say, you have you have this kind of medicine person. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, philosopher and ecologist called David Abram, who's got a book called The Spell of the Sensuous that I recommend, um, which is about language and perception and, and how we've kind of lost our way of perceiving nature. But he talks about the fact that in a lot of societies, the kind of medicine person, shaman person, they're 
they would physically live on the kind of edge of the community at the boundary of nature and that hit their role was to mediate between the social, emotional, psychological dynamics of the community and the rhythms of the natural world. And so he was supposed, or she was supposed to be sensitive to, to those rhythms and, and in the ceremonies, balancing, you know, the needs of the community with the, with the wider world, uh, you know, the natural world they're embedded in. And I think you need that. I think that's an incredibly complex balancing process and art that allows a community to be healthy enough to mutually collaborate. You know, so you have a bunch of free, truly free people, and then they get to choose to collaborate together. And I can imagine the only way we can solve this stuff is to have that model rolled out globally, where you have communities of people who govern themselves, they're, they're maximally free, and they're not forced to do anything. But if you, if you have 50 people and they live on a plot of land, day one, they're going to be like, okay, we should probably make a garden so we can eat, right? And then people are probably going to get together and, <laughs> and make the garden. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it, and it, but it depends on emotional health. It depends on the only reason people wouldn't collaborate or don't collaborate effectively is because of trauma and, and the personality disorders that come out because of that, where they lose empathy and they, they feel hostile to people. But luckily these medicines can, can heal that kind of thing. So I, I, that's the only, the only solution I can see is that having um, really normalizing trauma healing and, and mutual support, empathy, all these things that bind us together. Yeah. Um, so that we can live balanced with nature and with each other and collaborate in an effective way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just comes down to um, a mindset change. We all need to change the way that we see the world and how we act. And it doesn't, you know, I don't yeah. honestly necessarily believe that we need, um, you know, psychedelic substances to do that. But they're, you know, they're the quick catalyst to change. We all know that. But you can reach, you know, you can change your mind through long-term meditation or yoga or, you know, uh, Tai Chi, whatever these exercises are, that just takes a little bit longer. It just comes down to the concept that we need to change our minds. And that's how we change the world. Yeah. Like I, full, I firmly believe that psilocybin mushrooms can change the world. I mean, if you said that to a regular person, they'd be like, oh, get yeah. out of here, you druggy. Like this doesn't even make any yeah, sense. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true because it changes a person and it change, it, well, it has a potential to change a person and potential to change their mindset. And from there, they act accordingly. And that's what we all need, is we all yeah. need to just act differently. Yeah, I mean, the thing that reassures me when you're talking about being optimistic is the same way I said that glasses, like when I, when I think that the, the essence of glass exists in a glass, but that's not really the right way of thinking of it. It's more that I'm projecting kind of this concept onto it. If we think about what society is, society doesn't actually literally exist as a kind of physical thing it's yeah. a it's a term we use for how humans interrelate how they organize and when you realize that that all there is is humans and the way they choose to organize like that's all civilization is and when you realize that yeah then as you say well if all of those people were engaged in trying to improve themselves to be the most kind of um, compassionate empathetic people they could be suddenly by definition you would have a great society you know mm -hmm. you would in the same way that if you you know we take part of the the way we we don't make progress here is is a kind of pessimism that people insist on where they just kind of insist that people are always going to be horrible to each other um you know but it's in the same way like you can choose a good romantic partner and have a happy marriage like that's on the menu you can choose to do that in the same way and if you roll out that same logic and you say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to improve myself and choose to have an intentional, you know, healthy relationship with the people in my life. If everybody does that, suddenly you have a healthy culture. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and you're, if, if you respond to people who are difficult with compassion and, and trying to help them in their own healing, like that's the only, that's the only thing on the menu as far as I can see. And it's, yeah, as you say, once you roll it out to all the individuals, there's nothing else left to do because there is no extra piece of society that that is the society you know yeah exactly society is just a, it's just a collective it's just a collection of individual uh behaviors yeah. i guess or mindsets yeah yeah i don't know we got i mean we got a long way to go but we're getting there it's a it's a start we're, we're definitely getting there and like i said before it starts with just us having these simple conversations and uh people just opening their mind. There's, there's plenty of research that, you know, if, if somebody is open-minded, they could look something up. I mean, there's not like actual, you know, research. There is, there's slowly, it's coming out about psilocybin and plant medicines, but 
there's a lot of different, you know, anecdotal uh, experiences that you can read from people online now. And um, I encourage everybody to, to, to explore that because there's, you know, there's just so much that you can get from these things if you need it, if, if you know, not everybody needs it, it which is great yeah. if you don't. Um, but if you, you know, it, this, it's, it's a great alternative to prescription, you know, whatever you get prescribed and the mental health. I don't know what, the, you know, anything like a Xanax or, uh, I, you know, I don't like the whole, the pharmaceutical industry, man. Like I just, there's a, I, I know there's a lot of good to it, but then there's also in terms of the mental health field, it's just like, it's just ugly how they get hooked. Yeah. The people, they get people hooked on these things. And it's just like, I don't see, I mean, the, go ahead. Yeah, it's another one of those issues of, of a, a society that's that's favoring top-down control and evasion of confronting psychological material over the other option, which is kind of confronting your shadow material and growing and becoming whole. Um, you know, so like with something, you know, with, with pharmaceuticals, they do save lives and they're powerful, right? There are, there are people who are about, you know, who are on the brink of suicide who really need these and and there's they have they're a wonderful tool for those purposes mm -hmm. but you know when you look at the vast like there's just a gigantic chunk of society is on is on antidepressants yeah and you know some subset of them yeah you'd say well that's the right tool for them they need that but when you look at like you know it maybe was it like actually, i don't want to make up figures but it's you know at least an eighth i think of like americans are on antidepressants um probably more and it's at that point, you're like, okay, this is not, um, you know, you're kind of encouraged to believe it's some spontaneous brain disorder that suddenly for no reason, everyone's serotonin got out of whack. Like yeah. that's the mainstream story, mm -hmm. which is it's, and, and from day one, when I was taught at a university, I was taught that that was disproved a long time ago. And it's basically just a marketing tool now. It's like a neat story to tell, you know, for pharmaceutical companies and surprise, surprise, depression is far more complex. And it has a lot more to do with, your lived experience, you know, how connected are you to people in your life? What past traumas have you had? You know, like, are you finding meaning? Um, you know, do you feel just defeated and powerless in your life? Like it's a depression in particular, like radiates out to, to all of the interconnections in your life and whether they're healthy or not. Um, and, you know, it can be secondary to traumas and things. So we have a culture that is very quick to say, Let's put a bandage on it so you can get back to work because culture because our culture is about this game of progress and growth rather than about human well-being so the primary aim is get back to work try and cope um it's not about prioritizing your your actual well-being mm -hmm. um and so yeah when you see a gigantic chunk of society that has this this disorder to me it screams that there's a disorder with society it's a disorder it's the way we're living is making people suffer and if we yeah. if we don't think of depression as a disorder but instead we say there are lots of people who bet, who are not enjoying life. They're not enjoying existence. That a lot of people don't want to exist because it's not going like it's not. Yeah, it's not like satisfying them. It's not it in like an emotional way. Um, and if you if you lived in a family where, you know, one in eight people was kind of screaming that they were deeply deeply unhappy, then you should probably address that. You should probably figure out what their needs are, accommodate them, restructure things so that so that they can have a sense of well-being um but that's not the culture we live in so i think that's the the main thing as well would be shifting away from this relentless growth attitude of like your role is to to to, to chase progress again in the same way the kind of monkey mind just chasing thoughts in meditation um but instead to come back come into the present moment come into trying to cultivate well-being um and engage with whatever the material, whatever the things are in the world that are making you unhappy, whatever it is in your past or in the present way you're living that's that's emotionally not fulfilling you. Um, and yeah, it's astounding to me that the academic university track does not talk about this stuff. It will say things like, um, like it would look at the neurochemistry and it would just assume that it's got to be in there somewhere. And then it will say, oh yeah, like childhood experiences or this kind of stuff impact. It has some you know, it has some relevance, but we're, we're going to look at the brain chemistry and we're going to say off in the distance somewhere is your socioeconomic status and and whether you've had trauma and like, don't think about that. Those are causes, but we're going to look at the brain. To me, that's just, you know, it's a, you need to be looking at the whole picture. Um, yeah. But but again, our, our culture doesn't want us looking at the whole picture because it's pretty damning when you, when you look at how society is structured, I think. Yeah. And it's sick how you said that it's like a, 
it's a marketing ploy and how the pharmaceutical yeah. industry is just another business. It's, it's so like there's people profiting off of other people's sicknesses and the more drugs, yeah. it's just essentially like a, it's just like a drug cartel, you know, the more, <laughs> the more pills that they push of these antidepressants or whatever it is that is getting people hooked on, they're making more money. Like it's just, it's sick. And there are other models, you know, the U S is, the U S is a real outlier with how crazy it is with, with pushing medication on, on people. You know, there are, there are ways to do it that, that you can still get people the medications they need, but without the crazy like profit driven, you know, we're going to crank up the profit margin as much as possible and have people, you know, not be able to afford insulin. Like that's, that's crazy to me. Yeah. That's insanity. Is the UK a different model? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have the national health system, which is like, like kind of socialized healthcare, which is like just one of the most wonderful things in the world. Same in Portugal. I think don't say that in the there. U.S. Um, don't say that. I know. Here. I mean, don't, <laughs> don't get me. My wife is American and, and you know, she, she, she can't believe that, that we just have this over here, that like mm. you don't have to die. If you're, if you don't have money, you can just get healthcare. It's fine. Like, you know, mm. that's what our taxes are for. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the most wonderful things. And and it's the yeah she in particular i think the the way america american politics brainwashes people to think it's somehow bad is just astounding it's just a real disservice to the people um yeah and it's done for profit is you know it's done because if if you you know the, the companies that are making money are making lots of money and they don't want you know this this thing where it's not about profit it's about helping people you know like if you're diabetic in england you get insulin that's it you don't have to spend a penny you know um Mm -hmm. but yeah i see people who i think i saw someone the other day who was pointing out their insulin costs more than a a new xbox or something and they're saying like every imagine every week having to buy an xbox to survive like that's like it's crazy right yeah yeah oh sickness it's sick. Sorry, we got a bit dark there. <laughs> yeah, I get a bit dark, but it's the truth, you know? That's just like sometimes that, yeah. that's, that's like psychedelics. Sometimes it gets a bit dark, but you have to that's face true. the truth. And breaks the shadow. It breaks yeah. the shadow. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, what was it? Jack Nicholson, you can't, you can't handle the truth. It's, it's that's <laughs> what seems to be a lot of people just can't handle the truth. But there has to be people out there that just, we have to just speak the truth. Doesn't matter how dark it is. Doesn't matter, you know, whose feelings get hurt. There's certain things that we have to say, and that's, that's one of healthcare is one of them. Plant medicines are another. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole tirade of other things that we all just need to start talking about as conscious beings. We all just need to start talking about and changing our ways, man, because, you know, we're going, yeah. the, the world is, I don't know where it's going, but it's, it seems to be going downhill. But I think hopefully we're at the point where we can kind of reverse it, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I think um, compassion is is one of the the most important things because like, you know, as you say, like the things we've touched on for some people will be triggering. Like, you know, if, if, if antidepressants have saved their life because they were suicidal, you know, like it it can, it can easily feel kind of like we're attacking, you know, it's just that there are tripwires everywhere because it's tied up with people's like emotions. But I think if, you know, I get very strong vibe from you as well that, you know, we're both coming from this from a place of genuinely just wanting the best for the world and honestly trying to articulate how we see it and putting ourselves out there and, you know, in an open way where if people disagree, they can reply and, you know, there can be a conversation and yeah, you've got to talk about this stuff and hopefully move it forward. And as long as it's done with the the right intentions, you can't go wrong, I think. Exactly. Exactly. It's all about intention. And I think, um, I think we have the right intention. Dr. James Cook, me and you, we both, we're both on the same, on the same, uh, you know, we're in different parts of the world and different areas and of practice, but we, we seem to have the, the same intention. That's just creating a better world. And yeah. I hope you continue yeah, so. to keep doing that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep watching your videos, but I think uh, what I'm getting as we can, you know, I think we can wrap this one up. We, we went off on a lot of topics, but yeah, keep yeah. doing your thing. Um, I, I love what you're putting out. I think a, you know, if in the future, a lot more people will, will resonate with the message that you're sending. I think you're a lot more powerful than you think you are. And uh, this is the start of a whole new uh, online community. I, you know, just it's, it, we're doing something special here by just simply just having conversations. Like I, I'm a, I'm a huge podcast fan myself. Like I listen to so many and I, I realized the, the importance of just a simple conversation. There's something there's something mm. psychedelic about that. Like, I think I actually got that from Duncan Trussell. He said that like these conversations are psychedelic because it's just, I don't know what it is. It's just certain 
hearing a different opinion or hearing somebody put their words in one way that you never could think of and could bring you to a new insight. So yeah. can't stress it enough. Uh, definitely very important for what we're doing. Um, just like to say, thank you. It was an honor to have you on this. I don't remember really at all what we talked about. We went to a lot of different places, but <laughs> It was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a good conversation, <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah. Do you have anything else that you'd like to say uh, before we wrap this thing up? No. I mean, yeah. It's just absolute pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed it. You know, at the very least, even if no one else enjoyed it, I, I really did. So um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can check me out on YouTube, Dr. James Cook and uh, everywhere else, Dr. James Cook, basically. Yep. Dr. James Cook uh, with the Living Mirrors podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an E at the end of Cook, I should say. Cool. Cool. Dr. James Cook with the E at the end. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. James yeah, Cook. Um, like I said, you're always welcome on this. This was an amazing conversation. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep going. Peace.